This is the DTV Digest, the podcast that brings you news and reviews of films which didn't make it to the cinema. And now, here's your host, Mike Parkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DTV Digest. I'm your host, Mike Parkin, and joining me tonight are Richard Hawes. Hello, everyone. And Stephen Lockridge. Hello. In this week's show, we're going to kick off with a Vietnam War set film, uh, Ambush. Then we have uh, The Fear Way, Immortal. Casper Van Dien's going to turn up in Daughter. And then we have a very oddity, um, House on the Cliff. Our short shot this week is The Cowboy and the Samurai. And we're going to wind up with our DTV throwback, Mercenary. Our first review, then, is Ambush. Set during the Vietnam War, when a top-secret binder is stolen by the Viet Cong, a squad of inexperienced engineers are roped into a deadly mission with a specialist hunter brought in to help locate the enemy soldiers. However, the enemy isn't fighting conventional warfare. Um, it's quite refreshing to see a film like this, guys. Um you know, this this is a straight up war film. It, it's been ages, really. Um, mm. You know, I mean, okay, we had the outpost a couple of years ago, um, Danger Close, I guess. But you know, you, you'd certainly count these sort of films on one hand. And and this plays it all with a straight bat. We've got um, Aaron Eckhart as this uh, stone faced, stone hearted general. Um, who's desperate to get hold of this um, this binder, this sort of top secret ledger, which uh, is initially brought in by a couple of sort of shady um, special forces guys, and then there's a huge attack by the Viet Cong, and it gets stolen, and they have to go after it. Um, yeah, I, I thought this was really enjoyable. Um, talk about it more in a minute, but first over to Steve. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I agree with what you say, Mike. I thought it was really well done. Um... Really well acted. It's gripping. It's tense. It's claustrophobic. Um, you know, you the other thing is you've got Jonathan Rhys Myers and Aaron Eckhart who are like the top build in it. In it for a scene, a scene or two. I mean, Aaron Eckhart doesn't it, it doesn't actually share any screen time with anybody else. <laughs> He's just sat on his own at a desk, you know, on the radio, yeah. and that's it. But the performances are good, you know. It, obviously, he's not with anyone else. He's not there on that kind of set or anything like that, but it works. Um, I mean, to me, the lead was really Ackerman, you know, Connor. Yeah, yeah, Connor Paolo, yeah. Yeah, Connor Paolo, and I thought he was fantastic. The way he started out, you know, green behind the gills, not seeing any combat, engineer, basically. Yeah, in charge of the tents, as it's quite... Yeah, very much yeah. <laughs> but the way his character builds and steps up and becomes, like, Rambo, basically, you know, I, mm. I just I found it really, really enjoyable. Mm. I was pleasantly surprised. <clears throat> yeah, this, this, I mean, you know, this boils down to it's, it's, it's men on a mission, and it's one of those missions where we have a steady amount of attrition, you know, basically as well. Is anyone going to survive to, to actually complete the mission kind of thing? Um, and, and it works really well, I think. How do, how do you find this one, Rich? I discover it was a war film, you know, especially a Vietnam War film, because hmm. although, you know, like you say, there's, there's not many... Uh, the, from the look of it, basically, it looks like a contemporary sort of Afghanistan kind of setting, kind of kind of movie, which yeah. I was what is kind of what I was expecting. And mm. then you realize, no, it's a period thing, and there's uh, the there's definitely an an effort to kind of evoke Apocalypse Now at certain points, uh, especially at the beginning when they're sort of flying in and stuff, the sort of colors and and whatever they're going for. That's, that was the vibe I was getting. Um, mm. It's not that's not the kind of movie I'm interested in, but I was I. I was sort of sticking with it. I was, yeah. So, yeah, so I was tuned in because of Aaron Eckhart, but the, there were warning signs at the start that he wasn't going to be in it much because it comes up with Highland Media Group and Bondit Capital <laughs> uh, and lots of other companies. Uh, and yeah, he's he's kind of there at the opening scene, then he disappears. And the film 
doesn't really pin itself to a particular character for the most part uh at least at the, in those early stages you know we get a, a you know an Ali Ermi kind of captain character comes in is just sort of shouting a lot it seems like he's the main guy but then there's another one they bring in and uh, so it yeah it's sort of one of those films that doesn't you it's more of an ensemble piece it doesn't really pin you don't really pin to a particular protagonist until say the sort of the latter part of the film so one thing i wanted to focus on mentioning was the action sequences with especially those in the tunnels which i thought were very atmospherically shot and very well executed yeah. i mean the sudden attacks uh, in general sort of on the on, on above ground as well um was really good uh, and i tried to find out some information about the stunt team uh, but there wasn't really anything. I, I th it seems they're all. Uh, the film was made in Col uh, made in Colombia, and I think the the stunt team are all Colombian, and they don't have much of a profile. But I thought they did some really good work here. Um, the director Mark Burnham Berman uh, hasn't done anything else much that I've sort of taken note of. Um, the other thing, the only thing I really wasn't keen on was the music. At several points, the music just really bugged me. It didn't seem it didn't fit well. Uh, as far as I was concerned, there was it, it was either over, over, not not appropriate or to, just trying too hard or whatever. It was a bit too obvious and, and sometimes tonally just not fitting in very well. But that that's my only real criticism, apart from say the the casting thing of uh, having key people like Aaron Eckhart and and Jonathan Rhys Meyers sort of coming in, but actually disappearing for, for large amounts of time especially when John I've forgotten Jonathan Reese Miles was even going to be in it and then he turns up and then he, he's kind of in and out of the movie uh, <laughs> for the rest of the time but he I like I like Reese Myers he kind of makes a living of all these kind of movies now um, but he's you know he's one of those guys who started out quite strong in his career with you know things like Velvet Goldmine and stuff mm. um, but he settled into the, sort of the DV, DTV world and he did that what was that the Yakuza princess movie and, and stuff like that which we which we Black, found, found quite Black interesting. Butterfly with um, uh, Antonio Banderas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, cool. it means tons he, he's, he makes so yeah. many there's, there's like but, okay, but, yeah, but, but he's, a, he's able to pick decent characters as well you know he's not there. Mm. Yeah, he's very um, much a. He's always been a sort of a character kind of actor, hasn't he? So yeah. he's he kind of. I mean, it's, he, he he kind of loses himself in even this character. You know, you you're not watching like a movie star. You're watching an actor here, yeah. uh, and I think Jonathan yeah. Rhys Meyers works in this role. Uh, Aaron Eckhart kind of looks like Aaron Eckhart, and he's kind of being Aaron Eckhart for, to an extent. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, they are valuable players in there, but it, it's um there's a there's a, a whole large cast here but and yeah those the action sequences and stuff were, the, were what really sold it for me yeah the action's really good um the production values are really good we've got actual helicopters and things sort of flying in but there's something about the sound of a helicopter that, that just sort of like it's almost like an asmr thing with me you know <laughs> it's just like it just puts you on a sort of different level basically um Connor no Powell, exploding helicopters, unfortunately. Unfortunately, no exploding ones, mm. no. Um, but Colo Paolo, he was in the um, the Stakeland films. So oh, all right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so so I, I knew I recognised him from somewhere. Uh, I did like the music to this. Um, oh, okay. I, 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 I like Jonathan Rhys Meyer's character with the dog as well. Um, thought that you know made sense. I like the sort of cloak and daggerness of the, of, of the sort of scenario. Um, yeah. It, what it, did you it, think it about the whole really... the um the stuff with the the the, the MacGuffin, the, the book, basically mm. the sort of the disc, as it would be if it was a more contemporary would, yeah, film. Exactly. I mean, or, yeah. the whole it reminded Flash me at the start of the uh, Mickey Rourke film uh, War Hunt, where they mm. go out looking, you know, and it's an occult horror kind of thing. And I was thinking for a little while, I was thinking, is this going to go down a sort of a horror direction? Is this like a book of the dead or <laughs> something? And I was like, no, no, well, no, no. It's just it's, a, it's, it's just a book with some helpful sort of um, strategic information. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because I thought they was they had stolen it from the Viet Cong, mm. and it was it was yeah. top secret information to do with them. But it turned out to be information for for you know the good guys, or mm. you know it's, it's stuff that they had planned or something with with, with the sort of South Vietnamese or whatever. Um, so when, when you see what happens at the end, it's like, oh, uh, okay, that just seems really bizarre. But there you go. Um, 
but yeah, I, I I did enjoy this one a lot. It's this um, yeah, a very very well put together war movie. Uh, and on that note, how are we going to score it, Steve? I'll give it an eight. Yeah, so definitely eight for me. And Rich, I'm going to give it a seven. Okay, two eights and a seven for Ambush. Go check it out. <laughs> Our next film is The Fear Way. A young couple travelling down a deserted freeway find themselves being hunted by someone intent on keeping them on the road. Uh, this is nicely produced, I have to say, and it's got a decent performance from our old favourite um, Simon, Simon Phillips. Phillips. <laughs> Good old Simon Phillips. Um, but... I had a serious feeling of deja vu with this film. Um, and I, I knew exactly what was going on within five minutes of, of, of the start. Um, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So, Steve, how did you get on with The Fear Way? Um, yeah, very, very similar, I think, to where you, the direction you're coming from. Um, knew what was going on straight away you could tell it was so dragged out as well i mean it takes about 25 30 minutes before you even will even hint at what's going to happen mm. you know it's all don't get me wrong I, I like when characters are built up and you you know you get a feeling for them and everything like that but in this it was i just it just felt a bit toothless mm. if you know what i mean you know there's no no bite to it. You knew what was happening. Even the supposed boogeyman or whatever was like something off CBeebies. You know, it was just there's no oh, yeah. scariness there at all. It just all seemed a bit flat. It was. Um, it almost. It almost felt like a Christian movie. That's yeah. That's what I was you thinking. Know, it, it almost felt like yeah. a Christian movie. But um, I don't know if you ever saw this on Rich. Um, a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, uh, there was a film called Rika. Do you know that Rika. one? Rika. Rika. Um, it's a horror movie about these people trapped at this sort of diner, which was totally deserted. And there was this sort of, I don't know, sort of cloaked, masked person who you can always tell when he's near because of his stench, his reek. Basically. Oh, Rika, yes, oh, yes, yeah. I do. I, I don't know if I ever, there was a sequel, which I don't remember seeing, yes. but I, yes, I definitely saw Rika. Yeah, the, se the sequel oh, was more of the back. same, but actually, yeah, I know, yeah. The, uh, the sequel was more of the same, but actually done a bit more funnier. It actually had some decent mm -hmm. humor in it. But anyway, um, as soon as this film started, that's exactly what I was reminded of. Oh, um, interesting, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but with you know without the fun bits basically because because you know all all we're doing is following around this one couple you know mm -hmm. we need we need we need five antagonists so so people can be bumped off in interesting ways or something but we're stuck with this couple all the way through the film um and so you know try, trying to figure out what's happening to them uh they keep looping back to this diner which is run by simon phillips who's mm -hmm. about out of, play, out of place, as you can imagine, you know, because he's obviously got his British accent. Um, but, again, you know, it, it's another sort of very straight role for him. And I think he handles them very well, you know, like he did with the, um, yeah. that film where he was the butler. Oh, yeah. In yeah. That, uh, that weird uh, house. Remember that one? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I really yeah. enjoyed that one. Yeah, exactly. That was a good one as well. Yeah. Um, so, Most so, horrible things, I think that was. Yeah, that was it. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 a long time has passed since the days of UFO and, um, you know, Dine, Downing Street Siege and that sort of thing. Um, and I think he's sort of turning into a very decent character actor these days. He's very good yeah. in Butchers a couple of years ago as well. So, so yeah, he, he, you know, he, he adds a decent amount of presence to this film. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's just, as, as you say, it's toothless, basically. You know, we've only got two protagonists and, and you know, we have to hold on to them. For as long as possible, basically, and yeah, yeah. You know, and you, as soon as you, you know that, you see yeah. the twist coming an absolutely mile off. You know, and hmm. it's, yeah, yeah. It wasn't great. It's a shame. It was. It was okay. It was shot nicely. Um, the acting wasn't yeah. too bad overall, but um, 
it, as I said, you know, as, as soon as I realised what happened, I thought, yeah, this is this is, you know, yeah. I, I've been here before, basically. Uh, yeah, I've been to that diner before. So, um, anyway, uh, Steve, how are you going to score uh, the fear way? I'll give it a six. I think that is a fair do. Yeah, two sixes for the fear way. Go check it out. Our next film is Immortal. Uh, this is an anthology film with uh, four different stories, all about people discovering that they cannot die. Um, unfortunately, Steve, I only saw the first story of this, um, which was about a young girl called Chelsea, who's a um, high school student being sexually harassed by her, her um, coach. And her English teacher um, finds out that he turns out to have his own sort of motive going on. Um, I really, I did actually enjoy this short. I thought it was a very good sort of Twilight zone kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to see the others. How, how, how would you rate them overall? It's, well, to be fair, it's like any anthology, you know, you've got your good ones and your bad ones, really. Mm. Um, I'd say there's two that are decent, like the first one. Mm -hmm. And there was the third one, the one starring Tony Todd. Uh, okay. That that one is actually quite emotional. It's got a really, really good, good ending. You know, a real gut punch of an ending. Hmm. Uh, the other two, not great. I mean, the last one was pretty boring, to be fair. Um, it's a shame. The guy who kind of gets run over, finds out that he's immortal, then tries to get you know revenge on the person who's done it. Second one, again, was very, very strange. Um, it was kind of like set up as an accidental, mm. accidental murder. And then that goes wrong. And then you find out which one of them is immortal at the end. Um, right. So all, all in all, a bit of a mixed bag, to be fair. And I can't, mm. can't really go into it anymore because it'll just, you know, spoilers and stuff like that. But... Yeah, the performance was fine, and it all looked very, very similar. You know, mm -hmm. kind of shot. On, on the whole, all like a, like an Apple Plus TV series. You know, all <laughs> films, very similar way. You know, all yeah, same quality That's and everything like that. All in all, yeah, like I said, mixed bag. Two, two really good. Yeah. Two not so good. It's interesting. This is. Um... According to IMDb, at least. So we've got three different directors covering these. Mm. Um, we've got uh, Tom Colley, John Dubach, Dabak, and Danny Isaacs. But only one writer, um, John John yeah. Dabak, in fact. So he he's written all four um, sort of shorts, and they've been you know d different directors picking them up, which is a bit different to what we you know we would usually expect from this sort of thing, which would be basically to have. You know, different directors filming different vignettes, um, yeah. and then and then someone sort of like putting them together with a a wrap around or you know some bits to sort of join them together. Um, so so yeah, a bit, a bit unusual, but um, you know a bit of a shame that uh, they didn't all come together um, as well as the first one. I did enjoy that. It reminded me actually of the hit of um, the TV series Heroes with with the cheerleader. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that one, uh, you know, and it would be interesting to, to, to have seen what happens next at the end of it. It does sort of pick a rather convenient moment to end on, I felt. But yeah, yeah, no, I, think that's, that's, I think they're going for like all four of them, you know what I mean? It's like a slight twist at the end. Hmm. Yeah, not we're not talking Shyamalan style twist, yeah. you know, there's a little bit of that, but yeah. Steve, is it, is sorry, it, is the is cast is really good. Hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, the cast is good. I mean, Forms is not bad, but it's just, like I say, then two is just a bit flat and not really much. I mean, one of the second one, it's basically, you know, set in a front room, the kitchen and the garden. You know what I mean? There's no expansion on the world or anything like that. It's literally just two people and one having another conversation on the phone, that's it. Mm. And it's, it just so, gets so, to be 
So, so with each of each of them, other than, other than the first one, I mean, are, are you sort of like guessing, ha having to guess who's the immortal person? Yes. Right. Well, except for the last one. The last one is, you know, that's revealed well less straight away. Pretty early on, right? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I like the first one, but I haven't seen the third, the rest of them, so I really shouldn't vote on this one um, or score it, I should say. Um, but Steve, uh, what were you going to score, um, Immortal? I'll give it a six. There you know, even though, okay. even though it is uneven, and mm -hmm. two, the two that are decent are pretty decent. So, yeah, okay. So if you like anthology films, um, this one it certainly has its quirks. Go check it out. Our next review is Daughter. A young woman is abducted and forced to become the surrogate daughter of a family under the complete control of father, who gaslights his family into believing they're living in the post-apocalypse. Um, we have a great performance from Casper Van Dien in this. Uh, as two great uh, performances from him recently with uh, Mad Heidi, uh, just before Christmas as well. Um, very interesting sort of setup. Uh, it, it needed a bit more oomph, I think, but overall it's well acted. It's, it, it, you know, it has got this sort of very bizarre um, setup with the family and, and the sort of the way, you know, father is sort of spinning the truth and using excerpts of the Bible and this sort of thing to, you know, teach his son to homeschool his son, basically. And he's abducted this girl to, to act as his sort of surrogate sister. Um, uh, I got the impression that the idea was that when he turns 16, then um, he's like, congratulations, you're no longer his sister, you're his wife. You know, I think that's sort of basically where they were sort of heading with this. Um, and, and this, you know, this girl has to sort of basically comply as much as she can, but at the same time trying to use up things as, as they go. Steve, what did you make of Daughter? Um, no, kind of reminded me of you ever seen dog tooth no the, but I know, I know of it yeah the greek film yeah reminded me very much of that mm. you know with the father in charge and gaslighting the family and yeah someone, you know one of them biting back and yeah the cast of i thought was great in it um the mother and daughter were fine as well the one i didn't like was the, the guy playing brother McCaid, yeah. Now, yeah, I've seen him in another couple of things as well. I didn't like him. He's in Star Trek Discovery, one of the All right. things, season three or four. Didn't like him in that as well. Um, just find his acting. He, he just doesn't seem to be all there in the character. Hmm. You know, it's not the first time, you know, like I say, it's not the first time I've seen him. I just don't believe him. And that kind of let it down for me quite a bit as well. Sure. Um, but you know, it, it, again, it's one of these kind of like one location horror thrillers that you know is using his budget to a decent, decent hmm. way and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it was okay. It, again, nothing I'd seen before. Just really, really reminded me of Dog Two. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's been done. It has, yeah, that's true. So, so it is the performances which, which, which um, carry this, basically. Mm. You know, as I said, it's 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 not particularly original, um, but you know, it is well written. It, it's it's interesting. You know, I do get a kick out of um, you know things like sort of cults. You know, these sort of um, these sort of death cults and things. Where they sort of like basically, you know, their their um, ethos and their you know their sort of propaganda basically writes them into a corner, you know. Yeah. It's like it's yeah. like you know everything this guy, you know, Casper and Dean's character father is basically he he really literally has built this sort of house of cards, yeah. and and as soon as you know, you know, the, if he if he makes the wrong, you know, if he does the wrong thing or if he you know if he makes a mistake. At any point, it's all going to come crumbling down, and you know the the, the um, scales are going to fall from his son's eyes, basically, because it is that tenuous. Yeah. And we see that, you know, uh, uh, um, in the in the climax, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I I did like this. It's very weird with the um, the curator 
character who's sort of taking his pictures and um, you know putting them on display. Uh, that that was that was very weird. And, you know, at the end of it, you're still wondering exactly how complicit he is in in, yeah. in the whole thing. Um, yeah. that was that was an interesting twist. But yeah, it's 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 relatively quick. Um, but you know. It, it's a little bit mundane, I guess. And, and, and unless you're really sort of buying into the characters, you know, you're not really going to sort of carry it. But there is an interesting aspect as well that both, um, you know, this abducted girl called Daughter and the woman called Mother, who was also abducted many, many years ago and has been basically indoctrinated into this thing, you know, the old, um, yeah. you know, sort of Stockholm Syndrome to a certain degree, um, are both from the same... Um, Native American tribes, so so they're able to talk to each other in their own language as well, you know, which gives them this sort of individuality which they're not supposed to have. If you see what I mean, yeah. you know, the, the, yeah, he's trying to sort of, build, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's supposed to be sort of trying to sort of drive that out of them, but but there they are having little chats together. But yeah, overall, bit you know, it's 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 different, but at the same time, a bit ordinary. Mm. And on that, that basis, how are you going to score it, Steve? Again, I'll give it a six. It is a deserving of a six. Two sixes for Daughter. It does have a very good performance by Casper Van Dien. If, if, you know, all, if all you remember him is as Johnny Rico in um, Starship Troopers, um, take another look. Take a, take a look at um, Mad Heidi, because you know I, I, I think he is developing into a decent character actor. Um, I'll certainly sort of, you know, look out for him in, in, in future productions. So two sixes for Daughter. Go check it out. Our final main review this week is House on the Cliff, or to give it its full title, it is Baron Rye and the House on the Cliff. Uh, in this film, excuse me. A paranormal detective is called in to investigate an old house on a clifftop, the site of many suicides. Um, this just all over the place, Steve. It is yeah. all yeah, it over is. the place. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it becomes clear that, that you know they want to make a film about this character Baron Rye, um, yeah. who is uh, played by. <laughs> okay. Prien Shu uh, Chatterjee. Um, I do apologise for I murdered his name, but there you go. Or Prien Shu um, Chatterjee, um, who is a homicide detective working out of a sort of paranormal unit, basically um, desperate to try and prove that the paranormal exists. We first see him in uh, New York in the seventies. Um, investigating yeah. a murder. Um, there's no reason for for us nope. to see this no, so. at all. It has nothing to do with the story. Um, no. And then it sort of jumps forward to another case. And he goes and sees that. You know, it's almost like a montage. And then we get to the the proper investigation, which is in England. Um, this this Indian newlyweds have moved into this old house which um, was surprisingly cheap. <laughs> and the estate agent didn't want to hang around too long, <laughs> um, no, no. which is quite amusing. Um, and, and weird shit starts to happen. And of course, the husband doesn't believe her. Um, we, we understand that the thing's haunted because we see what happens to the priest when he tries to bless it. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's all about the visual style. And it's like a, uh, it is like a, um, you know, it's an Indian horror movie set in England, basically, um, with, with, yeah. with the most English cast. It's it's very strange. It is a very strange film. It, yeah, it is. It's weird. The editing's all over the place, mm -hmm. along with the pacing. Like you say, the, the first 10 minutes, it jumps from, what is it, like 1970 to 1973 to 1978 in five minutes, and mm -hmm. there's no need for them first two, two bits to be on there, really. Yeah, uh, you've got a paranormal investigator <clears throat> who doesn't really investigate anything. He's hardly, he's, he's hardly in it. To be fair, he's not. Mm. No, the um, yeah, the the, the, the wife is is kind of the main character. Yeah, 
And you, then you've got the local weirdo. Mm, yep. You know. That's right, yeah. Again, someone who's... They were saying about when the last James Bond came out, they were always putting bad guys or, or kind of slight villains in films with mm. scars on the face, you know. Oh, yeah. Same thing here. Uh, but it's just... It is all over the place. It, it kind of reminded me of like an ITV drama with a bit of horror thrown in. Mm. You know, like something like Vera on a Sunday night or mm. Heartbeat. <laughs> and then they've got these yeah, pretty rough it. special <laughs> effects, to be fair. You I know. thought I thought there was some interesting special effects in here. This, you know, it, it, it does sort of try to have um, a strong sort of visual style with, um, you know, the sort of freeze frame sort of stuff with the character sort of moving around yeah. within the frame. That yeah, sort of the kind of like bullet time. Bit. That, that wasn't yeah. bad, but like, say, you know, when when the priest is doing the blessing and the... Oh, the flies. Whatever. Yeah, you know, that, you know, them kind of bits kind of let it down. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very, very strange. It, like you say, it's kind of like a Bollywood film filmed in England and it I don't know. It's, it's, it's just yeah, yeah. it's it's Bollywood really most haunted. Balance. It's Bollywood most haunted meets heartbeat. It's yeah, what, it's yeah. what it basically is. It's it, I'm, I'm sold. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting. Sounds fascinating. It is. I, I mean I had no idea what to expect. You know, I was like, what is this when I was watching yeah. it? You know, I was, I was expecting. You know, it's from, it's from light bulb films. So I was, I was, I must admit, I was expecting something like a Steve Lawson film, um, to a certain degree. But no, the, you know, this is a bit more expansive than that. We got, you know, different locations. I mean, I'm not convinced by the um, the New York cops accents, but at no. least, you know, no. they got the costumes and stuff. Um, <coughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, that, I think a lot happens in it for sure. There that was another thing as well. There's so much ADR as well. Oh yeah, the whole thing. It's like the whole I, film has been redubbed, basically. Yeah, yeah, and it's just that little bit off. Mm. You can really, really tell and notice it. Um, it took me a few. I'll be honest. It took me a couple of dollars to get through it. All right. You know, mm. and I mean, I wasn't feeling hundred percent, so I was like, I'll watch it then. Get falling asleep, so it's like, oh, yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, I think like the wife is probably the best part of it, yeah. You know, um, she's yeah. you know, like, say she is more or less the main character, and I think she's actually pretty damn good, yes. Um, so, uh, Naira uh, Banerjee, it's a name, mm. um, yeah, it's very good, but, but then yeah. he, at the end, it just kind of. Dresses that, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, he just stumbles into the same old cliche, doesn't it? Oh, right, yeah. okay, we're gonna have to have an exorcism. Oh, you that's know. right. Just, yeah, I remember it's the book, isn't it? It's all to do with the book at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. It's very unusual for an Indian film to be picked up like this, you know, for it, this sort yeah, of distribution. Well, it is very strange. I mean, um, I know um, Indian, uh, Indian, Indian films are getting more prevalent now because of like Netflix yeah. and Amazon, you know, yeah. having quite vast catalogues. But still, yeah. in terms of actual VOD release or DVD release, hmm. it's um, and I think it's only VOD in, in this particular instance. Uh, yeah, it, it, it sort of marks out as quite an interesting one. You know, what what why did that? Why did they pick it up? What was uh, what sort of captivated the yeah. the buyer over at Lightbulb to to get hold of this film, I don't know. It's, I mean, the, the fact that uh, mm. it's uh, an Indian film shot in Britain or an Indian British co-production is quite interesting. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, there's certainly some novel aspects to it. Perhaps that's that's the driving force. But uh, yeah, I'm just watching the trailer now, and it's certainly a film that looks like it's got a reasonable budget and uh, and stuff. So. Yeah, and, and 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 as I said, it it does have its sort of uh, visual flourishes and. Uh, mm. You know, it does it sort of stand out a bit. It, it's certainly not the film I was expecting. <laughs> you know, um, from the, the, you know, the name of the film and the, and the setting and everything, uh, very, mm -hmm. very, very different. Um, there, there is one funny bit with the, um, you know, they're supposed to have like a um, sea rescue helicopter, sort of searching mm -hmm. the cliffs, and what turns up, you know, what they actually have is footage of a, um, like an Apache. <laughs> 
and yeah. Apache helicopter, which is like, yeah, that's, unless you're going to shoot them, it's not really going to be able to do it. <laughs> but, but other than that, I um, mean, also as well, it seems to me like they're setting this up for a franchise. Mm, you know, they've, yeah, got, yeah. they've got plans for people, you know, let's move on to the next paranormal case and stuff like It'd be that. nice if they did, uh, and, and I hope they, they you know, may, maybe sort of settle down with the editing a bit and, uh, you know, I mean, keep, keep the visual style, but sort yeah, of settle I mean, the keep, editing. Yeah, like, jumping. you know, scenes that last 10 seconds and it jumps back to somewhere, somewhere else and you're like, well, not mm. really needed. You know, if no. they'd have cut them out, they could have took half an hour off of, off of one side. No. But it's, <laughs> it, it's quite long. It's it is hours. just... Yeah, pushing two hours this one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, Steve, how are you going to score it? Uh, I don't want to say it again, but it, yeah, it's a six. It's a week of sixes, basically. Yeah. Apart from yeah, apart from ambush. Um. Yeah. Okay. I will join you on a six again. So two sixes for House on the Cliff. Go check it out. It is quite unique. Our DTV short this week is The Cowboy and the Samurai, The Legend of Jack Nicholson and John Belushi. Uh, in this one, um, Jack Nicholson, famous film star, uh, was making his directorial debut with a film a Western called Going South. And against the wishes of his producers, he cast up-and-coming comedian John Belushi from Saturday Night Live, um, who was famous at the time for playing a, a samurai um, in, in a series of sketches. Um, obviously, these two are sort of rowdy, ruckus ra raising, um, you know, celebrities, and they kind of clash. Uh, and, and this is sort of a fictionalized version of, of that. And I have to say, guys, the person playing Jack Nicholson nails it hard. I thought he was absolutely superb in this. Um, it's sort of like actually somewhere between Jack Nicholson and Christian Slater, but I was I was seriously digging it. I, I absolutely thought it was great. Um, how about you guys? What do you get? How do, how do you like this one? Uh, over to Steve. Um, yeah, uh, I thought the character balances was really good. It, the John Belushi to get to me was fabulous. Um, they both really caught like, the essence of the people. Mm. Uh, does it mean? I mean, it is a bit slight. It's basically two and I'm seeing them two, you know, just talking the way through and what we're going to do and, you know, try to calm Felicia down, uh, which I can imagine happened quite a lot because he was that kind of character, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, but it, it's, it's really enjoyable. It's just, does what it says in the tin. It's really fun and a bit madcap. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it could stretch to any longer, really. You do, know, know, yeah. do, you, do you know what this really felt like? This this could almost have been an excerpt, like a deleted scene out of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, it, 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 could, it could really sort of fit in with that, I thought. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really like this. Like, you know, it's is so different, so different to the sort of stuff we, we, we've been watching. Um uh, I, I I just really dug you know the idea of these two characters having this sort of you know building this sort of larger than life story between the two of them. Uh, Rich, you you curated this one. Uh, what can you tell us a bit more? The main thing that caught my interest when I uh, heard about the film was uh, Jamie Costa, who is playing Jack Nicholson here. Mm. I'd seen him in a few things. I think you might have watched uh, well uh, as well with me uh, the uh, Kenobi Star Wars fan film from uh, oh, yeah. 2019. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was a very very polished production. He he played um, he played Obi Wan Kenobi in that, mm -hmm. and more recently uh, you may have seen uh, a, a Robin Williams sort of test scene short film. I mean, it's sort of loosely classified as a short film. It's basically a test scene that um, sort of really uh, went viral. Uh, I think it was last year or the year before. Um, he's a very good. Uh, he's a character actor, but he's a very good impersonator. Mm. So you you see him mm. playing a lot of, he, he imitating a lot. So he, you know when he plays Kenobi, he's imitating um, Alec Guinness, yeah. Alec Guinness, and and yeah. uh, and, the, and in the, uh, he did another one called he did another Star Wars film. The same he's done a few Star Wars films actually. He's played Han Solo as well. He did a Star Wars Origins, which is another really good, very high highly polished um, production. 
in which uh, which uh, uh, just as an aside it's like a mashup of star wars and indiana jones uh, it's a really great idea it, it comes off some really big special effects and stuff anyway kenobi was a real shining sort of role for him i thought uh, and the robin williams thing really sort of jumped out so this is probably the longer longest thing i've seen him in you know where he's sort of sort of fleshing out the character a bit more um uh but it was also the guy playing um jay uh playing belushi who i wasn't familiar with who i was also very impressed by with this so i thought they had a great dynamic obviously it works that's the whole core of the film it has to be it's a it's a two-hander for the most part it's, mm. it's like them having that conversation uh, and the script's really you know good it works really well and what's what's great is that you get this i mean it's it's not like a lot of the stuff we we usually watch but at the end it kind of is because it turns oh, into yeah. this martial, art, martial arts movie uh a sort of a fantastical you know um uh 70s you know uh oh, what they call it uh what do you call it where it's you can't see the uh, silhouette oh, so they're all yeah. silhouetted and, yeah. and fighting and stuff it's all very very stylized and stuff that, that add in so that's that's a really, really makes for a really nice climax um it's very it's a really really good little i don't know if the plans are to do anything more with it but i thought it, it's a great li little sort of time capsule kind of piece say a bit different it's got a really great poster must be said as well mm. i wish i knew who the artist was to be able to mention them but yeah jamie costa he's he's been around for a long time he's he's in and out of lots of different things he's kind of on the rise but he's not quite got there yet um but you know more more roles like this that sort of get him get mm. him noticed and the, the the um the film's direct uh the, the the robin williams thing was actually from the same team i believe uh this was directed by uh jake lewis uh, and it made mm. it with his brother there are, they make a lot of comedy shorts and stuff so i think this is kind of the longest i think this is might be the longest thing that they've done i mean on the imdb jake lewis this is his only uh only credit uh and i think you know they're they're trying to make their sort of edge ways into into bigger sort of bigger things and this is definitely the way to do it yeah i mean i want to talk about the aesthetics of this as well um mm. you know, i mean that, that opening crawl you, you know setting the scene is it feels like you're watching the start of a videotape, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's got that sort of yeah. hum to it and a little bit, a little bit, you know, you need to sort of twist the tracking a little bit almost to sort of get it watching. Um, I, I actually watched the trailer for Going South after, after watching this to sort of get a flavour of that film. It's a film mm, I've heard yeah. of. I've, I've never actually seen it, I must admit. Um, I don't think many I, people have. Yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't even realise that Jack, you know, he'd, he'd actually directed that one. Um but yeah, it was, it, was, it was kind of interesting, this sort of setup where he's, um, you know, about to be hanged and um, in, in this particular town that, you know, you, you can be saved from hanging if um, one of the sort of the widows or spinsters of the town uh, takes a shine to you and, and marries you on the spot. And um, Mary Steenberg and does that uh, because she's got a plot of land you know, in, in, in California that they're going to mine. And she she needs a strong pair of hands to um, to do all the digging for her basically. So 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 that's what how how that gets set up. Um, yeah, it's interesting it's, it's, aside there, Mary Steenberg and that film. The film has also got Christopher Lloyd in, and of course they yeah. both went on to do um, the Western Back to the Future. Yeah, Back to the Future Three. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I knew I recognised him from somewhere. And in the trailer, we do have James Belushi playing this sort of laughing uh, Mexican character. Uh, as well. The other thing I did um, off the back of this was watch one of the sketches from Saturday Night Live. You can find them all on YouTube, um, which was very strange. It, it was J uh, John Belushi as this samurai in a hotel, and he's this sort of like you know the um, the concierge. And Chevy Chase comes in asking for a room, and Jim Bel J John Belushi's stick is is basically just sort of talking sort of gibberish Japanese at him and flourishing his sword and then yeah. and then right at the end he calls in um you know the, the bellhop to sort of take the bags upstairs and it's uh, Richard Pryor also dressed as a samurai and they end up having this sort of weird sort of like fight sort of thing <laughs> to decide who's going to take the bags upstairs it, it, it's weird um but yeah apparently they did they did loads of these sketches off the off the back of that um before he, you know him and Dan Aykroyd became the Blues Brothers, which uh, re really sort of cemented his career. But, uh, mm. That and Animal House, of course. Uh, 
but yeah no uh, th this is great as i said you know um the the feel of it you know it, it almost could have been you know a few doors down from leonardo dicaprio's character in, yeah yeah um, no i definitely i 100 yeah. get where you're coming from there yeah it definitely mm. fits that kind of vibe absolutely mm. And if so, I think if anybody, you know, those people, those who enjoyed that movie would definitely, you know, should go and seek it, this out. It's on, yeah. it's on YouTube and, and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love I loved the dialogue. I love I loved, um, the Jack Nicholson portrayal in this. It was superb. Yes, um, we don't score these shorts, but we certainly recommend you check them out and you'll find a link to this in the footnotes below. Go check it out. Our DCV throwback this week is Mercenary. Jonas Ambler is a rich businessman whose wife is killed by terrorists. So he decides to get even and hires a mercenary to find and kill them. However, there's one catch. He wants to go with them. Um, <laughs> this was very enjoyable. We've got um, John Ritter and Olivier Gruner uh, running this one. And it's a lot of fun. It is from 1996. Uh, it starts exactly like um, American Assassin, um, which is kind of weird. Uh, so I get a bit of sort of deja vu watching the beginning of this. But anyway, um, yeah, thoroughly enjoyable. Robert Culp um, also um, putting in some support. Um, over to Steve. Yeah. Uh, I found it really enjoyable, to be fair. I mean, it's. It's ridiculous. It's just <laughs> that it's over the top, but yeah, it, is, it, it works. Yeah, it works because you've got I mean, obviously you've got uh, what is it, Olivier Gruner? Never mm -hmm. his name right. And right, he's not the best actor in the world, is he? Come on, you know we've got to be serious about this. He's very stoic and quiet, and then you've got John Ritter, who's your motor mouth. You know, doesn't show up, and they, they they play well off each other, which I wasn't really expecting to be fair. But they do work; they do actually work well together. And you even got Martin Corb actually in there as well. Mm. Uh, Martin, oh, sorry, Martin Corb. Sorry, you know, he's not in it that long, but it, you know, the cast is actually pretty damn good, really. When you look at it, I've just noticed as well. Even even you've even got Jamie Presley in there. As the kidnapped girl. Mm. Oh, the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, I didn't realise it was her at all. But it's, you know, it can of remind me of like a stretched out indie Indiana Jones scene where they're trying to escape from like, I don't know, an underground cave or a submarine, something like that. And it's just goes from one to the other to the other to the other. And, you know, the action's pretty, pretty decent as well. Um, the only bit that lets it down really is the, I'd say, the helicopter mm. crash. <laughs> obviously, you, I, bet, I bet you were devastated because it didn't explode. Indeed. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, all in all. It, well, it, well it, did, it did explode, but it was off screen. Off screen. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> so, Rich, over to you. What do you, what do you make of it? I mean, I'm assuming you've seen this before and heard of it before at least. Oh yeah, I, I, I'd seen it before. It didn't make much of an impression at the time, and I kind of wanted to give it another go. Uh, the I've still, I still, I, I say I didn't really remember it. So a lot of it coming back of it, it was feel like watching it for the first time. But I was also noticing things that I didn't notice the after, and I was probably more critical. I think I'm, I really like Olivia Gruner in the right roles. I'm a big fan of uh, his films, Savage and Automatic and yep. Nemesis. We've covered all those of which we've I covered think, before, yeah. Yeah, all <laughs> of which I think suited him. And I think one of the problems, I'm gonna be more critical than you guys. This. One of the problems I think with this film is he is ostensibly the lead, but he's not a strong lead. It's not the right role for him. He is way yeah. too, he's not given anything to do um his say his stoic and stuff uh and that's just he, he doesn't get to, i mean he has no character there's no mm. not really any background any sort of development or anything he's 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 pretty much just stone-faced or whatever which doesn't really work very well and what i wanted from you know because the, the whole novelty of the film is john ritter i mean that's just the madness mm. of this film is 
why is John Ritter in a movie with Olivia Gruno? It's just such a weird thing. And it doesn't actually go for the, it doesn't go where you think it's going to go, which is the comedy buddy movie kind of route. Mm. It touches on it a little bit. There's a little bit of John Ritter comedy in there. I mean, uh, I mean, because I, I knew, you know, John Ritter's done a lot of stuff, but he's mostly known for comedy. So that's kind of what I was expecting from him. But you kind of get that opening scene where he's playing the hard ass kind of character. And then, and then he turns a bit comical for a minute, but then it doesn't actually, it's not actually going to stay that way. It's, it is much more of a serious movie. So I was a bit disappointed with that, although I thought they gave it a good go. What I like a lot is the supporting cast. I mean, Robert Culp is in it a whole lot. Mm. Uh, he's not just in and out. He, he's he's in. He turns up throughout the whole movie, um, uh, and he's really good. I, I, I thought he was great. Um, you've you've got you've, you've mentioned Martin Cove, who's fantastic. Uh, always turning up, sort of playing those kind of bad guys. We've got Ed Lauter, who's who's one of those guys who's who's always been like very shady. Uh, sometimes he's a good guy, sometimes he's a bad guy, or whatever. You're never quite sure about him. Uh, we've also got Neil Allen Stewart, who's a, a stunt sort of. Well, I consider him like a stunt movie, a stunt icon. He's, you know, he's got the shaved head and the sort of plaited uh, thing and the big handlebar moustache. And he's been in tons of stuff right up to um, recent films with Scott Atkins, like uh, uh, Deck Collectors, mm -hmm. Deck Collectors 2, have, Payback, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, and he's actually got more to do in this movie than he usually gets as well, because he usually gets he turns up in a scene and sort of get because he's a stunt man, he turns up and gets sort of thrown around. In this one, he's he's like part of the team. Yeah. So he's in it. He's he's yeah. got quite a few scenes. The the budget is, I mean, even just so looking at it just from a car standpoint, already you're on a better footing than most of the DTV action movies you see now. And then you put the action in and you know, it's all of a pretty good standard. We've got multiple set pieces involving, you know, vehicles. buggies got, and yeah, exactly. and vehicle yeah, we've got vehicle. I mean, we got proper. We have proper stunts in this, like proper vehicle mm. stunt, proper vehicle mm. and other sorts kind of stunts where people look like they're really being hurt. Uh, so you know, this is there's not there is the CGI like you were like you guys have mentioned. And there's the there's mm. the helicopter stuff and that which is which is ropey, but there's some real, you know, um, uh, solid action being uh, being done here um it's too long as well that's another problem it, it really could have been a bit tighter it's an hour and 42 which is uh which is really stretch uh, at the kind of top end which you know you don't normally um, get that you're normally in and out in 90 minutes and i think what, it could have shaved off a bit here and there what was interesting as well is that martin cove's character is sort of built up to be the the big bad you know the leader of this thing and he basically disappears at the halfway mark, almost. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> well, this is this is one of those movies that does that two uh, two villain twist thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but but like, I didn't mind know, that too much. I don't know. I was, I was, I was expecting. I was, you know, I was gutted one, that he wasn't in it longer. Yeah, I was, I was expecting. I was expecting, and I, I don't know if the characters were as well. It's one of those things like, oh, he cut the head off the snake, and the rest of it dies, sort of thing. It's like he cut off the head of the snake, and all he do is piss off all the other snakes. <laughs> it's basically what happened here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know they get the whole army sort of coming after them, which I thought was great. You know, to keep it going. But yeah, no, this this was. Uh, where were they fun. supposed to be from, by the way? Were they Russian or? Well, where, where, where Russian was... slash Asian. Yeah. It could be a mixture. Like of... um, uh, what's um, what's it called um, Kazakhstan uh... or somewhere like that. Yeah, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. That's yeah, what I was trying to yeah. think of. Maybe it's supposed to be Kazakhstan. But yeah, as you were meant. I mean. Uh, Steve mentioned Jamie Presley turns up. I'd forgotten she was, and I had known she was in it, but I'd completely forgotten. So she turns up, and I'm like, oh yeah, because this is like on the border. She was all, she was just coming, she was just about to cross over into bigger movies, and uh, mm. and then obviously later TV series and stuff. She's done quite well, but this is where she started. She was doing all these kind of B movies, and that. she even did one with um, uh, Tom Sizemore, Tick, and, and Stephen Scarborough film Ticker. She oh, yeah. did that one. Um, yeah. she, that was that was kind of 2001 she was already sort of on her way then by then but you know she's I don't know she's still around doing quite a lot of stuff if, yeah. if I recall I mean she's very she was doing a lot of stuff in TV and stuff but um, mm. yeah so she she has like one very brief moment hers is a comical moment uh, where she's just re she's just been rescued and she's just really foul mouthed and they're like gee <laughs> it's like dad's gonna dad's gonna be really glad to have you back kind of thing it's, it's like a nice little moment but um, I I I 
um, uh, you know, I, I liked what they were doing at the beginning. So, you know, uh, some Um Olivier, Olivier Gruner and his, his partner, you know, were, were this sort of extraction team kind of thing and, and doing these, you know, slightly shady deals, you know, so, so other people can keep clean sort of thing, you know. Um, so I was trying to think of some examples because we've seen a lot of that kind of thing. And I was trying to think of what a good thing to compare it to of, you know, he's the sort of seasoned veteran sort of teamed up with the sort of tough guy and they're doing the uh, going out to uh, do these kind of missions and stuff together. And I was I couldn't really think of uh, anything, not, anything. Not nothing really. was particularly yeah. coming to mind. But I know that I mean, there's more recent stuff like Uncharted kind of does that mm. sort of thing. You know, you've got the or the video game, you know, you've got the yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Mark Wahlberg sort of you know that character that Mark Wahlberg mm -hmm. ended up sort of not playing because they changed him too much but in the in the short film with Nathan Fillion mm. so you got Nathan Fillion and um mm. Stephen Lang it's I think Stephen it was yeah. uh, that, that 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 they had that kind of dynamic I thought but mm. that was much more jokey whereas Olivia Grun is just a stone you know <laughs> he's just no, yeah. there's no there's not a lot yeah. Yeah. there but Robert Colt kind of does the heavy lifting in all those scenes which really really helps mm. but one one of the things I've sort of mentioned before is the idea of you know you never ever see one of these shady deals go completely to plan yeah <laughs> you know it never happens you know if there's, a, if there's a drug deal somebody's going to try and rip somebody off or the cops are going to turn up or something you know nobody ever sort of just like put, picks up the briefcase and just walks off you know <laughs> two guys walking off in other directions um you know but here we almost get that when they when they sort of, you know they pick up this package from some yakuza guys and it is, it's, it's a great little sort of sen tense scene because you're kind of like waiting for the shoot to drop, as it were. But, yeah. um, you know, they're able to say, no, okay, well, we've got what we came for. There's your money. We're off. <laughs> and, and it's only later <laughs> that you realise they've been, you know, double cross sort of thing. But, but um, yeah, I was, I was quite impressed with that. It was like something I've been looking for for ages. You know, just, just the, the shady deal that's actually completed without any complications. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Another thing any, I just want to mention is chat? this was for, no this um this is for, I think we talked about it before when we did Savage but the uh, director uh, or I think it was the writer and producer as well uh, Abby Nesha, Nesha mm -hmm. who went by the name Patrick Highsmith for for his directorial credit so he kind of credits himself under different names I don't know if that was an effort to sort of make the film look bigger than it was by having more people involved I don't know but for some reason he used the, the, the pseudonym. Uh, Maybe it's because he's Israeli. He thought that was was a better way to go. I don't know, but uh, he's actually. I say I know I've mentioned this before, but it's quite weird because he he was doing all these B movies, I guess, sort of Manachem Golan, you know, canon style stuff mm. uh, during this period, and then he's gone on to be a really really serious filmmaker, um, doing yeah. like you know quite heavy well, dramas but, basically but funny you mention that because uh, last year we covered uh, image of victory image of victory which, yeah. which was which was one of his yeah um, so he, he really yeah. Yeah. he's 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 just gone completely and in, in a different direction uh, so if you go if if you look at his filmography you, you it's all action b movie kind of stuff mm. until around 2000 and it, and then it's like dead serious yeah. and i'd i'd be really interested to see him come back and do mm. something that combined the both, you know, do the, do the, do like a fun, you know, silly action, action movie, but with that sort of experience that he's gained from the other side of the camera and, you know, make it in, uh, in his native land would be, would be really interesting to see as well, because all of these films were made for the American market. So they're all very sort of uh, English language and, you know, American, American sort of in cast, but all the, all the stuff he makes generally these days is in Israel. Yeah. I believe so. I'd I'd love to see him do an Israeli action movie. Maybe bring back some of the. I don't know. That would be a really interesting thing for me to see. Anyway, just I think he's a really good filmmaker. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, we do not score the throwbacks, but we do recommend you check them out. Um, Rich, where, where can people find this one? Is it is it on YouTube? I believe it's all over YouTube. And I don't know if you guys watch the same, but it's probably the same version that's going around all the different channels. But there are some very obvious edits of some of the violence which was unfortunate it was it wasn't this isn't kind of a 
um, you do find this with some of the YouTube stuff, they edit sort of the sex and violence and that out to, to mm. you know, to not get messed up with the algorithms and all that sort of stuff. So this one doesn't suffer from the former, but it's definitely the, the latter is like, there's a, there's a few um, obvious little trims here and there, um, which I was disappointed by. I'd like to be able to see it on uh, Prime or something. Uh, maybe it is available there. I haven't been, I haven't, I haven't seen it. I haven't been able to, I haven't found it there personally. It's probably on, in America, you know, if you're listening in the States, it's probably on Tubi and stuff. It's probably all over the place. I think it's one of those movies that's kind of got uh, less, uh, I don't know, co less copyright kind of stuff around them. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the, the distributor has basically sold it to everyone for pennies, you know, so it's really easy to find. Yeah. But even so, it is definitely worth a look. If you, if you like, um, you know, your 90s action, uh, this has got a lot going for it. So go check it out. And that is the end of this week's show. So thanks to Rich and Steve, as usual, for helping me get through these films. No problem. No problem. Jolly good. You will find links to the trailers for all of the films we've covered in the footnotes. Uh, also, the short shot and the throwback will be in there as well. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter at the DTV Digest. And also check out the short shots where Rich puts a new short or a link to a new short every evening around about eight o'clock. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. Thank you for listening to the DTV Digest. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and tune in again next time. <laughs>